Okay. So today, we must continue our reasoning about uh, um, the, the stationarity condition for energy. So if you remember, we imposed that the deformation energy, which in the considered case is equal to the total energy, because we are imposing only y, because we are imposing only essential boundary conditions. Okay, so this is the particular case which we are studying. Then we imposed that delta E dot is equal to zero for every delta Q. And we, uh, how to say, reconstructed the reason for which this condition has to be verified for every small variation of the uh, equilibrium form. So maybe it is now good that we, work, we write in this way. So the first variation of the total energy is an approximation of this finite increment, which we called delta E dot, okay? And delta E dot is the best linear approximation for delta E dot. So the small delta E dot, this is called infinitesimal variation. This is the finite variation. Okay. And what we we uh, we uh, have proven that when delta k is small enough, you can find a linear approximation for the finite variation or finite infinitesimal increment infinitesimal in, uh, finite increment. Okay, this is a finite variation of the energy or a finite increment of the energy or infinitesimal variation uh, or infinitesimal increment of the energy. So what we have found, we have found that there is a linear approximation for the finite increment. And we calculated this linear approximation, and it was given by this formula. Okay, then remark that k0 appears inside p, and as it is obvious, this finite increment depends on k0 in general in a nonlinear way, and it depends linearly on delta k. Okay, now this is not true. Uh, sorry, this is not new. Okay, when we wrote f of x0 minus f of x 
f of x minus f of x zero, nearly equal to the first derivative of f in x zero times x minus x zero. Okay. This we have called delta x, so one can write in a completely equivalent way this equation in this way. Okay. When we have written this, this is the best linear approximation. It is linear in the increment, so linear in the increment. OK, but nonlinear in terms of x0. OK. So when you write the equation f prime of x0 equal to 0, in general, this is not a linear equation. OK? So as we are generalizing this argument now, we have the functional of total energy. We calculate the finite variation or increment of this total energy. And we find the best linear approximation for delta E dot. Of course, linear in delta Q. OK, making our calculations, we have found this formula, which now I copy. So. We have found. That. The first variation of E tot, in our particular case, tot and def deformation and tot are in this case similar. Now, PAI has been defined as dW over dFIA, and this is obviously a function of F0. OK, in our calculations, we wrote this. So we, we have that d e dot delta e dot as a function of key zero and delta key is given by the integral over c star of d over dx a p i a delta ki i plus the integral on the free part, I mean the part of the boundary where we are not imposing the displacement, the essential boundary conditions, which we have denoted in this complicated way for the moment, of p i a delta ki i. OK. And this first variation, if key zero is a minimum, 
then delta E dot of key zero delta key is equal to zero for every delta key. Okay. Now, while it is easy in the case of one function of one real variable to write this equality for every delta key, delta x, when you write this, you ask yourself, which is the real number such that multiplied times every other real number delta x it is always equal to zero to this question you have a trivial answer f prime is equal to zero so you forget about everything else and you learn by heart that if x zero is a uh, minimum, then f prime of x zero is equal to zero. And you forget the whole procedure which led you to this result. Okay. For us in continuum mechanics, this process of forgetting is not so easy because our expression is. Uh, more complicated because we must find key zero such that this first variation is equal to zero for every delta key. Now Lagrange when found this expression needed to deduce an equation for key zero for the field equilibrium placement which was implied by this equality valid for every delta key i okay So let us for a while discuss a, a theorem from mathematical analysis, which is rather, I'm sure that you studied this. It is called, it is one of the many Lagrange theorem. Theorem. There are many Lagrange theorem. This, this theorem tells you the following. I have a, a function defined in an interval. Okay. Let's call this function f. Then I know that the integral between a and b of f times delta, delta is another function of x is equal to zero for every delta. So let us assume that for every delta, function of x, this integral is equal to zero. And I want to know what happens to the function f. You understand this is a simplified version of our equilibrium condition. Because here you have that this first variation of the total energy is equal to zero for every delta key i. Okay, we have 
a more general situation here because we have three functions delta ki i, and the integral is in a volume. But let us start making, you know, mathematics is like that. You have a difficult problem, you split it in simpler problems. When you solve each of the simpler problems, you have the solution of the biggest general problem. So let us attack the essence of our problem. And this simplified version of our equilibrium condition is the version which was studied at first by Lagrange. Okay. Very well. Now, the idea of Lagrange is this one. He considers as delta of x a specific test function. You know, if I have an equality valid for every delta x, then this equality is valid for a specific delta x. So in particular, I can take, I can choose a specific x zero here, and I can consider x zero minus epsilon, x zero plus epsilon, and I can consider a function which is zero from a to x zero minus epsilon. It is linear between x zero minus epsilon and x zero, and this height has value one over epsilon, and then it goes linearly back to zero. It is zero in x zero plus epsilon, and then it is zero outside. OK. This we can call, I mean, this function, it is astonishing. This specific class of functions is the basic uh, function is the basic class of functions used in finite element elements method. It is the piecewise Linear, the set of piecewise linear test functions. It is astonishing to see how uh, Lagrange did invent the basic finite element method many years before this method was used for doing numerical computations. So what you have, let's call this delta epsilon x zero. I call this function delta epsilon x zero. So, I know that integral between a and b of f of x delta epsilon x zero is equal to zero. And this is true for every epsilon and for every x zero. 
you agree with me. Okay. So this is the integral between x zero minus epsilon and x zero plus epsilon. Why? Because delta is zero outside of f of x delta epsilon x zero. And this is equal to zero. Okay. Now, let us assume that f of x is continuous. Okay. Delta is clearly continuous. Okay. So I can apply f times delta is continuous so i can apply the mean value theorem for integrals okay so at the end, what can I tell? That this integral is equal to is equal to the length of the interval. So two epsilon times the integrand function calculated inside okay to be precise i should write delta you agree with me that delta is a function of x parameterized by epsilon and x zero delta if i have this variable x I have the value, which is this uh, delta reduces to a linear function in the interval x0 minus epsilon x0 with positive uh, derivative. And it is another linear function with negative derivative between x0 and x0 plus epsilon. So this delta to be more precise, is a function of x, which is parameterized with epsilon and x zero. Okay. So, let, let us be precise in this. In this way, we understand all the details. Okay, so the mean value theorem tells us that this integral is equal to the thickness of the length of the interval where you are calculating the integral times the value of the integrand function in a point psi, psi belongs to x0 minus epsilon, x0 plus epsilon. Okay. So if you remember, I have a function g of x, 
which is continuous in a certain interval, the mean value theorem tells you that Uh, this drawing is not so much realistic. That you have at least one Xi such that the area of this triangle, which is F G of Xi times B minus A, is equal to the integral of g of x dx in the integral a b. So this and this is true that you can find a xi giving you this value uh, uh, exactly because g is continuous. This is essential. And I think that in Europe we call it Roll Lagrange theorem, or it is equivalent to Roll Lagrange theorem. Okay, now we must calculate the limit when epsilon tends to zero of Q. 2 epsilon f of xi delta epsilon x0 psi. So when epsilon tends to 0 here, what can happen to xi? Can only converge to x zero. You agree with this? So, to be even more precise, this is psi of epsilon, because psi of epsilon belongs to this interval. Okay. So. We know that limit when epsilon tends to zero of psi of epsilon tends is equal to x zero. Okay. So this limit. You know why? Of course, uh, I stop here one moment. The, this is not a difficult argument, but you need to be concentrated on it. But I, I want to stop you because I will repeat every step another time uh, for you. But I want to tell you a, a nice, nice, sad and nice uh, fact which happened to me. I am uh, giving this part of my lectures uh, more or less uh, every year since I started to teach. And the reason is the following. When you study mathematical analysis, they oblige you to learn these theorems, telling you that, that they are very important. In general, students don't believe it. They believe that professors are teaching this mathematics simply for a kind of mental deprivation or because they like to cause troubles to students. You know, many students believe that we are teaching them something because we have fun, we are sadic, and we want to uh, oblige you to suffer. OK. For which these things are taught in mathematical analysis without any connection to a specific physical problem. Is that mathematics is applicable to every mathematical modeling of reality. So 
you can use this mean uh, theorem, uh, mean value theorem in economics, uh, in, in another part of physics. You are not obliged to use it in calculating the first variation of the uh, deformation energy. So mathematicians want to give you the required abstraction. They want to underline that they are giving you a tool whose cap capacity, capability of being applied is very general. So from their point of view, this total lack of discussion of any possible application of their ideas is the essence of what they are teaching you. OK, so in a sense, they are teaching you the letters of an alphabet without telling you that the letters can be glued together for forming words. In another course, you will glue the letters together, if you allow me this metaphor, for uh, building words. So they give you theorems, which are like letters in the alphabet. And then in any specific theory, you build your uh, theory like a word, gluing together different theorems. OK, now here, I try to tell you how Lagrange, a young 17 years old student in a very good school in Turin, was obliged to invent many theorems in mathematical analysis in order to solve his mechanical problem. So it is written in the books. You can go there and read, and read these. It is written in the books by Lagrange how he was developing his mathematical analysis for calculating the first variation of the energy function. So one can see how a mathematical theory was invented. OK, so let's go back now to our uh, uh, mean value, uh, sorry, to, uh, to our uh, estimate of the consequence of this equation, which was this one at the very beginning. So I repeat for you quickly what I said up to now. So we know that for every delta, the integral between A and B of F delta equal to zero. Of course, this is f of x, this is delta of x, and this is the integral over dx. OK? As I know that this equality is true for every delta, am I allowed to use this equality for a specific delta? Yes, of course. OK? So I use this specific delta. I find a delta which is centered in x0 as value 1 over epsilon in x0. OK. It is 0 outside the interval x0 minus epsilon, x0 plus epsilon. And it is linear, piecewise linear. It is linear between x0 minus epsilon and it is linear between x0 plus epsilon. OK. Then I write my condition for every epsilon and for every x0. OK, as this is equal to 0 for every epsilon, I can calculate the limit for epsilon tending to zero, having fixed x zero. This I am allowed to do. And I apply the mean value theorem for integrals. So I estimate for every x zero, 
and for every epsilon, this integral, and I have two epsilon, which is the thickness of the interval, so it is b minus a in this case, times the value of the integrand in a specific function psi, which depends on epsilon, because it is inside x0 minus epsilon, x0 plus epsilon. Okay. Now, it is trivial that the limit for epsilon tending to zero of psi epsilon is x0. When epsilon tends to zero, a point in that interval tends to x0. So, this limit can be easily estimated because you have f of x0 times the limit of for epsilon tending to zero of two epsilon delta epsilon x0 psi epsilon. But del delta epsilon x0 psi epsilon tends to one over epsilon when epsilon tends to zero. So two epsilon times one over epsilon tends to two. Okay. Now we can go back because, you know, this limit is two. So we find that this limit is two f of x zero. Nothing bad because this limit is equal to zero because, you know, this integral here is always zero for every x zero and for every epsilon. So we finally deduce f of x zero equal to zero. So we have proven that if for every delta integral of f delta is equal to zero, then f is equal to zero. The only function which multiplied every function delta as an integral which is equal to zero is the zero function. Of course, the hypothesis is delta continuous and f continuous. Otherwise, we cannot apply this. We cannot apply this theorem. Okay. Now, uh, we will need this in future. In any case, it is important for you. If during this reasoning, you want that the integral of f delta of x zero epsilon x is equal to f of x zero. Then these two is uh, uh, disturbing us. So we go back to our definition of delta and we define it one over two epsilon at the maximum value so that here you get two epsilon, this limit is one, okay? And you know, this sequence of deltas converges to something which is called Dirac delta. A Dirac delta is the linear function which maps to every function its value in x0. So 
So the sequence of deltas which we have introduced, piecewise linear functions, the integral of delta Dirac times f of x must be equal to f x zero. Even if we, we need a lot of discussions for understanding better, delta of x zero is the limit in a, in a sense to be understood of delta x zero epsilon x, which we have introduced now. This limit means that integral of delta x zero of x f of x is equal to integral of delta x zero epsilon x f of x. But I mean, this is a delicate point. So what I want to say is that this sequence in the limit allows you to introduce the famous delta, Dirac delta function. Okay, so we can close this mathematical bracket, parentheses, and we go back to our problem here. So we know that for every delta ki i, This equality to zero is verified. Okay. So we know that. Let, let me copy this another time. Mm -hmm. So we have now the tool for proving the final result which we need. We know that This integral, this sum of integrals, is equal to zero for every delta ki i. So what we do? We go to our c star, and in every point, we build a delta multiplying a delta in this direction times a delta in this direction if this is x1 x2 and x3 and a delta in the third direction okay and we consider delta chi 1 equal Delta in the direction one times delta in the direction two times delta in the direction three. This is a function of only x one, this is a function of only x two, and this is a function of only x three. And they are centered in capital X zero. Okay, so delta one of X one is equal to delta of X one zero epsilon X one, as we did before. 
So, you know, I am slowly telling you how you can build finite element test functions. So what is used by Gomso? And simultaneously, I'm telling you how Lagrange did his reasoning. Okay. Okay, now, uh, you know, we are lazy. We invented the index indexing. We invented the indexing. So, I don't know what I'm doing here. So, sometimes I am touching something wrong. Okay, so as we are lazy, I write delta i. I goes from one, two, and three. X i, zero, and X i. And then we impose delta key two equals zero, delta key three equals zero. So that in this integral, here, only delta key one appears. Okay. So we do the reasoning for one, then you understand that it is applicable for for every for i equal one, i equal two, and i equal three. So what I get? I get integral of d p i a d x a. Now i is equal to one delta q one plus integral over relevant part of the boundary. We call it delta bar of C star of P, P here I forgot N A. I don't know what what I did, but I forgot the normal, obviously. So where it disappeared, here. We are applying the divergence theorem. So yeah, you remember, I forgot this. Now, you can ask me why you did immediately discover when it was necessary to understand it, that you were wrong and that you needed sounding with the index you should have learned that I have a scalar and every contravariant index must be saturated. Otherwise, I cannot get a scalar. So it is clear that my formula was wrong. Okay. So this is equal to zero for every delta key one. And the Taki one is built in this way. Okay. Now, if I choose an X zero inside the volume, I can repeat the argument mean value theorem is valid for functions defined in R. So I can repeat the argument so that this implies that delta P A one dx a is equal to zero for every x zero. This is called localization 
condition, Log localization uh, theorem. And this is the local condition. Okay. Okay, as this is true for every I, you know, now mathematicians could be very upset. I am being very bru brutal uh, for ending this argument now. So, somebody writes this like divergence. This is a shortcut divergence of P equal to zero. What, what this means? I write capital letters for divergence because we are calculating the derivative, the derivatives with respect to capital letters. And P, I, A, this is an Eulerian index. Okay, so the divergence of P is an Eulerian vector. An Eulerian covector. So div P A I by definition is this. I'm wrong. Here I'm right. So you have the saturation of this A. And you have the index i oh, mamma mia free. So T zero is stable equilibrium, a uh, stable equilibrium. configuration implies that for every x0 belonging to the interior of the reference configuration, div p equal to 0. OK? Now, it is a delegate issue it is a rather delicate issue to okay let's let us continue as we know that this divergence is equal to zero, this is equal to zero. So we are left with this condition. So let us copy it to try to decrease the possibility of copying errors. So what we have here, we have that on the parts of the boundary, you know, I cannot tell you anything in the part of the boundary which I have blocked here or which I have displaced with a given displacement. 
but I know that here delta key is equal to zero. Okay. Okay. However, here I can consider one half of the neighborhood which I considered before. And I can invent a similar epsilon argument which selects the value of P and in one point of the boundary. So actually, what, what can I do? Uh, as I did already, as I already know that the divergence of P equal to zero, I should not be worried about this integral, which is now zero, okay? So I am left only with the surface integral. So what can I do? I can consider a neighborhood on the surface, on the boundary. So I can consider a small region around x0 on the boundary. And I can consider instead of three deltas, only two deltas for selecting the value of this factor of the integral. So at the end, I find P I A N A equal to zero in the part of the boundary where I have not prescribed the displacement. Okay. So I have the tensor P saturated N equals zero on the boundary, on the part of the boundary where I don't have prescribed, I don't know why I'm placing the star down, as I placed always the star up. Okay. Then I have divergence of P equal to zero in the interior in the interior of C star. These are called the strong conditions for equilibrium. Of course, P uh, I A is equal to D W over D F I A. So this is a function of F. F is equal grad key. So at the end of the story, you have divergence of dw over df ia grad key equals zero, and dw over df ia calculated in grad key n. Okay, I should be consistent, so I don't write the indices there. E equal zero. This is in C star interior, and this is in the part of the boundary where we did not impose boundary conditions. Of course, we must add key of x equal x 
in the boundary where I have blocked in the part of the boundary where displacement was imposed equal to zero, and I must have that the placement is this one in the other part of, of the boundary. This we have called essential boundary conditions. And as these are boundary conditions applied, these are boundary conditions applied where you don't have imposed displacement, no imposed displacements there. So sometimes there, these conditions are called free boundary conditions or natural boundary conditions. Why natural? Because they are automatically verified if you impose the minimum of energy. So they are, they are verified when energy is minimum. Okay. So mathematically speaking, to find the minimum of the deformation energy, with essential boundary conditions is possible by solving the system of partial differential equations given by Divergence of P equals zero. Pn equals zero. Q assigned on a part of the boundary when P is given by dW over dF. This is called this partial system of partial differential equation plus boundary conditions is studied in the theory of elasticity. Now We have 15 minutes, so I need to prepare what we will do in the next lecture. But before we proceed, consider this. When you write integral of WF, this is the deformation energy. What you need for key? You need to know key, the gradient of key. You need to have that the integral of W of gradient of key exists. And you need to know that key is assigned on C star one and C star two. So when, when 
you impose the minimum condition you need this regularity for key. So you need that key is defined everywhere, included the boundary of the reference configuration. You need that the gradient of key exists. And you need that the integral of W of gradient of key is meaningful. OK. Instead, when you write the, these conditions, stationarity condition, When you have written the stationary, stationarity condition, what do you need? What do you need? Think about it. You need the divergence of P. As P depends on grad key, you need the second derivative of key. OK, because when you write d over dx a of dw over df i a uh, not this way. This is a function of grad key equals zero. So you need to find D applying the chain rule in this, this partial differential equation involves the second derivatives. Of okay, so you need a stronger regularity for grad for key. So these conditions which we have found here, sometimes they are called Euler, Lagrange, conditions for the deformation energy for the functional which we are minimizing okay the Euler Lagrange conditions are very often called strong formulation for the equilibrium problem. OK. Now, I believe that I could do this in a quicker, in less time, but we don't mind. Let's let's try to do everything in, in the required detail without running too much. But I need to use these 10 minutes which we are left for uh, telling you how uh, the story continued. I am sure that you have studied the problem of Saint Venant, at least the engineers here. We, we have a mathematician, so I will try to give some details. If needed, we can give some extra work 
a small exercise to the mathematician so he understands better at this point. If you remember, in every course of strength of material, this problem for linear elasticity, so when P, when P depends linearly on grad key, this problem is solved. Solving this partial differential equation with the boundary conditions on the lateral mantle of the cylinder unloaded, so Pn is equal to zero, and giving suitable conditions on the bottom and top basis of this cylinder. So, Saint Venant could find closed form solutions for the deformation problem, linear elastic, linear isotropic and elastic for the deformation problem. So, so what can we conclude? Before computers, before the computers era, we started from the principle of minimum energy. Okay? So we formulated the problem of minimum of deformation energy with essential boundary condition. We, I mean, humankind. Okay. They could not calculate this minimum. So what they did? They calculated the first variation of the formation energy. They imposed that it has to be equal to zero for every virtual displacement delta key. Okay. Then they found div p equal zero, p n equal zero, this in C star interior and in the free part of the boundary of C star. They wrote p equal d w over d f. Somebody calls this constitutive equations. for stress because somebody calls this stress. It is Piola stress. Okay. This is the condition of free boundary. You write that key is assigned in boundary C star one union boundary C star two, essential boundary conditions. You painfully solve this problem 
in a particular case and you get informations for building beams using Sam Venon solutions. So what happened? When Navier in Paris was teaching to engineers the deformation of a beam, he decided instead of starting from the minimization of energy, his reasoning was, this is a postulate. Instead of postulating the minimum of energy, I can postulate these two conditions, and I call them balance of force. Then I postulate a constitutive equation. I assign the kinematics. And without making the painful calculations, which I've shown you in the last lectures, I can immediately teach to practical engineers the solutions found by Semvenon. So actually, a big group of scientists decided to postulate the balance of force. I will tell you in the next lecture how we can do it. They postulated the constitutive equations for stress, and they postulate Euler Lagrange stationarity condition. Okay, so I will need to prove you that this approach uh, will not allow his its followers to generalize standard first gradient continuum mechanics. And second, this approach is not useful for numerical applications. And this is the reason for which I prefer to start from the origin and to postulate the minimum of energy as a basic principle of our theory. So it is not only for historical reasons. You know, as I told in a lecture we, uh, two, three lectures ago, it is important for persons who want to try to invent new models, it is very useful to see how mathematical models were invented at first. So this is one reason. But another reason we will see in the next lectures, if we don't use the right 
the most efficient postulation scheme, then we are in trouble to find numerical solutions to our problems. Okay, so I think we can stop here.